let's start. Today we are going to talk about another class of deep generative models, namely flow-based generative models. Okay, so as before, we are given a data set. Let's say with n samples, x1 to xn. These can be n images that you have. And each of these xi's, they live in a d-dimensional space. Now, again, we are basically back to a probabilistic model like VAE. So we start with a model like this that I'm going to generate some uh, latent uh, sample Z, let's say from a normal distribution. Uh, but here, the dimension of Z is going to be the same as dimension of X. Unlike VAE that we had a smaller dimension for Z, we are going to use the same dimension. Next, I'm going to use an invertible or bijective function to map Z to X. So my X is going to be equal to, let's say, a function generator function with parameters theta of Z. And the important point here is that we want this function to be bijective. And therefore invertible. So in other word, words, for each z, I have one corresponding x and vice versa. For each x, I have one corresponding z. So there is this bijective mapping between my latent space and my image space, my X space. Okay, good. Uh, so this defines a probability distribution, obviously, for uh, X. So we refer to that probability distribution um, uh, by P theta of X. Yes, it is a one-to-one -one mapping between Z and X. And theta is basically my model parameters. All of my model parameters are uh, shown by theta. Okay, so if I wanna go from Z space to X space, so I'm gonna use the function G. G theta is the function I'm using. That is my generator. Uh, this process is called either generation or sampling process. generation or sampling. But the good thing about this probabilistic model is that I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between X and Z. So I can actually go from X space to Z space. I know what is the exact latent sample for a particular image that I observe. So that process is called inference step all right so how can i go from x to z i can go from x to z using the inverse of my function g and i know function g by assumption is invertible so the inverse exists g uh, theta inverse for simplicity i'm going to show it with f theta F sub theta. So F is a function taking us from X to Z. G is a function taking us from Z to X and they're uh, inverse of one another. Okay, uh, so one assumption that we have throughout uh, today's lecture is that uh, F and therefore G is a differentiable, differentiable function. Just to not worry about, you know, potentially some uh, non-differentiable uh, non uh, uh, points. Uh, so there's a question, what is P theta? That's the probability density of uh, X. So uh, your Z is according to a normal density, then you map, then map Z to X using a function, then you get another density function. So that will be, P uh, theta of X. 
Okay, so th this sounds like a good, um, um, good probabilistic model to uh, start with because uh, z is a random variable, normal random variable, can be easily sampled. And if G is a rich class of functions, let's say neural networks, then we can come up with very complex densities in the X space, potentially can represent uh, data sets like images. Okay, so, but what are the, what are the bottlenecks? What are the uh, issues in this uh, particular formulation? Uh, I see a lot of uh, questions in the chat box. Let me actually pause and see if um, uh, there are some questions. Why do we need a differentiable function? Uh, you know, it is, you know, you can have ReLU functions as well, uh, but not to get into the technicalities of uh, measure zero non-differentiable points, because in training, we are going to train them using uh, SGD. Uh, methods, we are assuming everything here is differentiable. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I'm happy that you guys answer each other's questions. Very good. Okay, so let's look at one example. Uh, let's suppose my dimension is one, one dimensional case, and a function that maps the z space to the x space is something like um, like this. It should be an invertible function. Right? That's a g function mapping z to x. Okay, so I have a density uh, in the z space. That's the density I know. It's a normal density. So I know, for instance, what is the probability if I look at an interval with a very small uh, length of dz, I know what is the probability that my z is going to end up in this particular interval. And that is basically the density function pz times dz, which is the, um, the length of that interval. Now, if I look at uh, the corresponding mapping of this particular inter interval in the X space, so the amount of the probability mass should be conserved. So, and this is equal to PX, density of X, times DX, the length that we have uh, for that particular interval. So this is like a, very famous and uh, kind of elementary uh, equality to map densities from one space to another space. Therefore, we have PZ times DZ should be equal to PX times DX. So if I wanna, I have a PZ, I wanna find uh, PX, right? So that's the density in my image space. Then PX is going to be equal to PZ. times dz over dx. It's the change of variables in the uh, um, in computing the density functions, right? So usually in uh, any probability 101 courses, they cover uh, this equation. Okay. Uh, now, what happens in higher dimensions? So uh, this was an elementary uh, mapping, uh, densities from it, one dimensional space to another one dimensional space. What happens in a, in a high dimensional space? Let's say we are, um, in a two-dimensional space, or maybe 10,000 or 100,000 dimensional space, uh, the formula that we have to map the densities uh, from z to x is uh, pretty similar. So px is going to be uh, equal to pz 
uh, times this term. So this term, what was the dz over dx? It was like the um, kind of the expansion, the ratio of um, uh, if you take a very small interval in the z space, how much it expands or shrinks in the x space. Right? So if the if your slope is uh, very uh, small, then uh, uh, very big interval in a, a z will correspond to a smaller interval in x and vice versa. So the, in the high dimensional space that uh, the, the, the length of the interval uh, should be replaced by the volume. And the change in the volume from z space to x space is determined by the um, determinant of the Jacobian matrix uh, from z to x. So therefore, here we are going to multiply with the determinant of the Jacobian. Uh, dz2 uh, over dx will be a matrix here. That's the Jacobian matrix. We look at the determinant of that matrix, and that will be the factor that uh, is being used to map the density from z to x. Okay, so this is the Jacobian matrix by J, I'm going to show it, Jacobian matrix. It's a D by uh, D matrix because both Z and X, they live in a D dimensional space. And that's it. Right? So that's the formula that we have to uh, do the change of variables in uh, densities between two spaces. And maybe, you know, this is not covered in probability 101. You know, sometimes they cover it, sometimes they don't. Uh, but it's uh, it's not a difficult fact. Okay, uh, alternatively, it is easier to uh, apply a lock function to um, uh, this equality and get uh, an equivalent equality of log of px to be equal to log of pz plus log of the determinant of the Jacobian that I just show with J for simplicity. Okay, now we are good, right? So we have the probabilistic model that we have uh, according to the G function or from X to Z, which is the F function inverse of G. And uh, I have the PZ, which is a normal distribution. So the density of X would be just that normal distribution multiplied by the determinant of the Jacobian um, that uh, we have uh, as um, a D by D, dimension, uh, D by D matrix. Okay, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. Okay, so I see some questions in the chat box. Um, are, such are such models good for detecting out of distribution samples anomalies? Um, we'll talk about that, hold on to that thought. Great, uh, thanks Phil for posting that paper. So I'll be talking about that at the end of today's lecture. So. Okay, um, any, any other questions? Are we good, is it clear? Right, just the, the change of variables um, for uh, mapping the densities so far. Okay, uh, good, so now we have a density function in the X space. Then we can use our uh, old friend maximum likelihood to pick a good model parameter to uh, maximize the um, likelihood of observing a particular data set from a particular probabilistic model. Right, so maximum likelihood. All right, so we are given a data set. 
x1 to xn and we are given a probabilistic model p theta of x which is p of z times determinant of the Jacobian matrix. All right, sometimes I'm just, you know, going to assume just for simplicity, I'm going to not write theta, uh, but, you know, for instance, all of them, they depend on theta, right? So the mapping from X to Z that determines the Jacobian is um, determined by my model parameter. The corresponding Z here that I should plug into the Gaussian density is also determined by theta because f is the function um, mapping me from x to z. So all of them are implicit in theta. Sometimes I, you know, won't just carry the theta notation for simplicity. All right. So this is my probability uh, probabilistic model. So the maximum likelihood would aim to pick theta that maximizes the probability of observing this data set from this model, right? Uh, we assume the samples are drawn independently, so the probabilities will be multiplied to each other, probability of x1 times probability of x2 times probability of xn. We apply the log, it doesn't change the uh, optimizer. Uh, so we, at the end of the, the day, we get this objective, that we look at the uh, sum of the log of p theta of xi. And that's the uh, maximum likelihood uh, uh, optimization that we have here. Note that uh, here, uh, p theta of x is a number between zero and one. The log of this would be negative, right? So this whole thing is going to be a negative number. So we are maximizing, we are trying to pick the best, you know, negative number closer to um, zero is going to be better for us. Uh, in this context, sometimes it is easier to look at the, the minimum of the negative of the objective function. So this is obviously equivalent to min over theta, one over n, some i one to n minus log of p theta of x, then uh, this objective is going to be a positive number and smaller better for us, uh, right? Because before, you know, a uh, larger negative corresponds to the smaller uh, positive number here. And that's it. That's the optimization that we plan to solve. Um, Sometimes uh, people refer to the objective, to the objective of this optimization uh, with some units like nats or bits. And that stands for natural unit of information. Bits, obviously, they present bits uh, because of the connections to the Shannon entropy, but that's, that's just the terminology. Uh, again, here, lower, better, right? So we are minimizing this objective function. Okay, that's it. That's the flow-based uh, generative models. So we finished a little bit early today. Are we good? Then I can just plug in my, my um, formula for p theta of x here. Then I can just solve it using SGD. Would that work? Isn't there a coupling issue again? So I don't understand what you mean by a coupling issue. I just plug in this formula that I have. Let me actually plug in for you because now we have time. So I'll basically look at min. one to n. Okay, so what is the, let me put negative here actually, just for simplicity. So I'll have log p of z plus um, log determinant dz over dx. 
and that's it, right? So again, all of them, this is the I, this is the computer that XI. Okay, so uh, I see some um, some um, some comments. Uh, one comment is that how do we ensure she is bijective? Good, uh, uh, good uh, comment. Yeah. So, but let's say you know I come up with a bijective function. Right? So I design my neural network to be bijective. Uh, then another comment is that computing determinant is expensive. Um, and another comment is that neural networks are in bijective functions, so what functions do we use? Uh, great points, great points. In fact, these are the heart of the challenges that we have uh, here, right? Um, uh, first of all, how we can design um, some bijective functions that are also have uh, good expressive power. Obviously, I can design a really simple bijective function, right? Um, let's say you use an affine function <coughs> with like an invertible uh, matrix, then that's a bijective function, but it is not going to give you much because an affine transformation of a Gaussian would be just the Gaussian distribution. Um, another issue that uh, one of you mentioned is uh, this guy, right? So this determinant of the Jacobian, you know, not, uh, not very easy, right? So in general, in fact, uh, the determinant computation can be very expensive. So for small matrices, we can, but uh, remember, so it's a D by D dimensional uh, matrices. So ImageNet has um, um, 10 to the five, roughly speaking, pixels. Uh, so this will be like a 10 to the five times 10 to the five uh, image uh, uh, a matrix. So it's a huge, huge matrix. So the determinant can be super expensive. Um, there are some high variance more efficient determinant computation, but even then, uh, those implementations would be very expensive in this scale. And they, they'll be also like pretty, pretty noisy because they provide high variance um, uh, estimations of the determinant. Okay, so the key idea here is to come up with matrices, uh, Jacobian matrices, and therefore mappings from Z to X or X to Z, uh, whose uh, determinant uh, of the Jacobian is easy to compute. Come up with Jacobian and therefore the mappings, right? So F or G mappings, because they, they correspond to the Jacobian matrix, such that determinant of this guy is easy to compute. But also we want to have a rich class of uh, mapping functions, right? So there's this trade-off you know, between, uh, between these two things that we want, right? So um, let's start uh, just to warm up. Let's start with an affine transformation, right? Warm up. Um, obviously invertible affine transformation. So what I mean by that, let's say X is equal to A times Z plus B. And A is an invertible matrix. So this matrix is invertible. So what is the Jacobian here? So here Z would be equal to what? X minus B, A inverse times X minus B. 
So Jacobian, which is dz over dx, would be A inverse. Okay. So I want to compute the determinant of A inverse. Very expensive, right, in general. So this is a little bit of a bad news because affine is usually like a case that things work out. <laughs> if uh, things don't work out for affine, then it may not be easy in general. And affine is not gonna give you a complex uh, distribution in general, right? Because you know it is um, uh, an affine transformation of a Gaussian will be just a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Then, uh, then what is the second um, uh, best thing we can, we can do? Uh, so there are suggestions you can, you know, restrict A to be a certain class of um, functions, right? That a certain class of matrices that uh, whose uh, Jacobian is easier to um, compute. Uh, for example, you can say idea one, you can try to have a Jacobian who is a diagonal matrix. But in that case, the inverse is easy. The, the determinant is just like the multiplication of the you know, diagonal elements. Say if Jacobian is a diagonal matrix, something like this, you have J11 to JDD, the rest is zero. Then we have this really simple uh, formula, right? Because um, the eigenvalues are just the elements on the diagonal. So the determinant is going to be just the product of the elements on the diagonal. But really easy to compute because the log determinant would be just sum of log of the elements on the diagonal. Very easy to compute. We can compute it in gradient with respect to these elements, so on and so forth. Um, Okay, so this is the uh, Jacobian that we like because I know how to compute the determinant. Uh, but the Jacobian comes from a mapping. Right? So question, what is the mapping which F uh, results in a diagonal Jacobian? Because I want to also see if F is rich enough or the inverse of f is rich enough in order to have a good expressive power. So which f would correspond to a diagonal Jacobian? Any element phi's function, that's exactly right. right. So because you don't want any interaction between your coordinates. Right? So if you have an f function, mapping from a d-dimensional space to another d-dimensional space, defined as, let's say you have another function, applied coordinate-wise, f bar of x1 to x2, so these are coordinates of x, these are not, a, it's a little bit of an abuse of notation. So here x is like x1 to xd. So if it has applied coordinate-wise, then the derivative of you know, one coordinate with respect to another z corresponding to another coordinate would be zero. So all of the off-diagonal terms would, uh, would be zero. Uh, but is it good? Is it a good expressive function to map element phi z to x or x to z? Yes. Uh, or no, in fact, right? So it's not going to be a very strong, um, strong generator for you because you then look at each pixel independently than the other. So you would lose any uh, really high level, uh, semantic level um, structure in your images. So 
uh, this won't give us a good generative model. Not very expressive. Okay. Uh, All right, so what if there are some other suggestions? Um, what if A is orthogonal? Good, you know, because you're, you know, you know, the determinant is plus minus one, but it's rotation, right? You know, in a way, it's not gonna be very expressive either. Um, how about the convolution? Um, convolution, um, you know, the Jacobian is going to be more difficult, right? <laughs> in, in fact, so we have a recent paper um, uh, for another problem to just look into characterizing the Jacobian of a convolution layer and looking to the spectral radius of uh, that Jacobian. Um, that's going to be even more complicated because without you know, um, going to the details, that Jacobian is like a really, really huge matrix. Uh, there are some techniques that you can reduce the computation to be roughly speaking the same level of computation of um, an affine matrix, uh, but still that's going to be very expensive in general. Okay. Um, so basically we're, we're stuck here and uh, one idea um, came up uh, from um, the real NVP paper. By Dan Etiol. And they basically had this really uh, simple observation that, okay, for Diagonal matrices, Jacobian is easy to be computed, but so is for a triangular matrix. So if you have a triangular matrix, let's say you have diagonal elements. Let's say upper diagonal elements are all zero. But the lower diagonal elements can be non-zero, any non-zero elements that you want to have. And even for this matrix, determinant is the product of the elements on the diagonal, right? Exactly. So you have. Uh, determinant of this matrix. It's another, you know, algebraic fact. So then the question is, how can we use uh, this uh, well-known fact in developing a mapping from X to Z? Right? So before uh, my map was like a one-to-one -one in order to uh, coordinate wise, in order to get a diagonal Jacobian. So what would be what would be the corresponding f or g for this particular Jacobian? So upper uh, triangular or lower triangular, doesn't matter. And that's the basically key idea of real NVP, that they use the following mapping, really uh, clever mapping. Uh, so they say, okay, you give me an x, I'm just going to divide it into two partitions. Oh, where did it go? I'm going to divide it to x1 and x2. x1 is like maybe half of my image, and x2 the other half of my image. I'll just you know make an arbitrary partition for me. Then I'm going to define my mapping as the following. Right? So f maps this x to um, Z, let's say X1 is mapped to Z1, X2 is mapped to Z2, uh, same dimension, right? Okay, so I should draw them in the same, same length, just to, 
Okay, so this is Z1, this is Z2. Okay, now I'm going to define my mapping as the following. The mapping F applied to X1 is not going to change X1. So I have Z1 would be equal to X1. I'm not changing uh, half of my, uh, half of my uh, pixels, no change. For Z2, I'm going to, again, uh, have a component-wise affine transformation from X to uh, Z. So every coordinate of Z would be an affine function, let's say S theta, uh, element-wise multiplication to X2 plus T sub theta. And these S and T, there are some parameters, whatever. So I'll, in an affine way, I'll transform uh, each coordinate here. So this is affine. But here from X to Z, this is identity. I just copy paste. Right, and you, you know, uh, okay, so first let's see if it actually corresponds to uh, a triangular uh, Jacobian matrix or not. Uh, so here, S, T, and theta, T, these are coefficients of my affine map. They can be computed by any arbitrary functions, say neural networks, of X1. functions of x1. Potentially you can use like a neural net here and people use neural nets here. Okay, so you have x1, you copy it to z1. For x2, uh, first you apply these neural nets, s, t, and theta, t, uh, theta, to uh, get these coefficients computed by, as a function of x1, and then use those coefficients to linearly, in an affine fashion, uh, transform x2 to z2. That's basically the mapping that they develop. Okay, so let's look at the Jacobian of uh, this mapping. Okay, so here, uh, the first element is dz1 over dx1, right? Uh, dz1 over dx1 is identity, right? Because we are just copy pasting. So I'll have identity here. So this part is dz2 over dx2. What is that? That is just an element wise affine transformation between x2 to z2. So it will be like a diagonal element with elements S theta in the diagonal. And so it will be diag of S theta. All right, so what about this term? This is dz1 over dx2. Does z1 depend on x2? No. No, it doesn't, right? So you get zero in your upper diagonal term. So you get zero here. All right, so what is this term? This is dz2 over dx1. Does z2 depend on x1? Yes, right? Because my coefficients, s theta and t theta, they depend on x1, right? So I'll have a matrix dz2 over dx1. But do I care to have a matrix, complex matrix here in my determinant computation? No, exactly, because I, I got my zeros here. So the determinant of j would be, okay, so identity, all the uh, elements are one. So it will be just the uh, product of uh, S thetas. S theta i's. 
And that's it. That is the corresponding Jacobian for uh, this matrix. Um, so is it invertible so, or not? If you, um, let's say, if I give you an X, can you compute corresponding Z or vice versa? <laughs> yes, uh, how? So let's uh, just uh, take a look at invertibility here. Invertibility. So I give you X1, then you compute basically Z1. That's good. Because you have X1, you compute the coefficients S theta and uh, T theta, and uh, use X2 with these coefficients to compute Z2. All right, so that's the inference step. Very easy because what basically you need to do is like do like a linear uh, affine uh, transformation. For the inverse, you do like the inverse of an uh, element-wise affine transformation, which is like super, super easy. Okay, so it checks uh, the two boxes that we want to top. Right? So one is invertibility, Jacobian is easy. But uh, we are a little bit better than a diagonal uh, Jacobian uh, element-wise transformation. But the question is that, is, is this expressive enough? If you have a normal distribution in your uh, Z here, uh, then you want you know, to have a function mapping from Z to X to represent distribution of images. Is, is this going to be uh, enough in order to um, uh, do that um, representation? Okay, so uh, I see some questions about invertibility of S theta. This is applied element wise. It's a scalar, right? So like say it's a number two times X2 coordinate I plus S. So it's an element wise affine. It's always uh, invertible. Okay, good. Um, again, let me uh, repeat my question. So you have a normal distribution here. And you wanna have images here. Is this a good uh, represent the expressive uh, mapping from Z to X and vice versa? Okay, I see a no, why? Come on guys. Okay, good. Um, uh, because of the linearity and still Gaussian, right? There. So this part is Gaussian, and I'm just copy pasting x1 to z1, right? You know, this part is you know therefore going to be Gaussian. Half of my images is going to according to Gaussian, and the other part comes from just the you know element-wise affine transformation. So, is this expressive enough? No. Okay, so that was our second attempt. Okay, so uh, so by the way, this whole thing is called coupling layer. This whole uh, architecture that I showed it has a name. It's sometimes called affine coupling layer. Okay, so what can we do? What can we do? Then we, we had a couple of uh, attempts. None of them, they were you know, satisfying. So in order to get um, better expressive uh, power, we can in fact use composition of functions. Right? And that's not specific for this particular 
coupling layer or a diagonal um, in J or whatever. Right? So we can uh, we can use composition of transformations. So what does it say? So if you give me k invertible functions, let's say f1, f2 to fk, if I look at the composition of these functions, obviously f is going to be invertible, right? Because each of them, uh, each of these individual functions are invertible. So a sequence of invertible transformation. So this is sequence of invertible transformations. So it has a name. So it is called normalizing flows. A sequence of invertible transformations. So here I map um, x first to maybe another variable using f, f1, then I use f2, then at the end I use fk to map it to uh, z. And the inverse of this would be like fk inverse, which would be G, gk, and so on and so forth. So that's basically the uh, composition of uh, invertible functions. So inverse of f1, f2 would be f2 inverse composed with f1 inverse. Okay, so uh, how about the uh, gradients of these functions? Because at the end of the day, we want to compute uh, gradients. Gradient of a composed function, f2, f1, evaluated at x, it's just chain rule. It's a gradient of f2 evaluated at f1 of x times gradient of f1 of x. Just the chain rule. So that can be done efficiently. And what about the determinant of the Jacobian? Because at the end of the day, I, um, I want to look at the Jacobian. Jacobian would be the product of the individual Jacobians. And the determinant of the product of the Jacobians would be just the determinant product of the determinant of the Jacobians. Right? So in other words, if I have a good design for each of these functions that are whose determinant that are invertible, uh, whose determinant are uh, easy to compute, then I can just compose maybe k of them and uh, still it is going to be easy in terms of determinant computation, in terms of the invertibility, but it will increase their expressive power. Okay, so let me actually show this with the uh, affine coupling layer that we, we had, right? So um, in the affine layer, affine coupling layer, so what we what we were doing? So we were like saying, okay, x, I partition my x to two parts. I copy one part to my z, and then I have an affine transformation to get z two, right? Uh, and then one problem is that like for a given partition, then one part of your uh, x space and z space they are going to be the same. But then maybe I can come up with like maybe various partitioning of my x, maybe especially channel wise, and compose them. Then I basically mix it up, right? And that will be a more uh, expressive uh, class of transformations from x to z. So in particular, in uh, the real NVP architecture, they use uh, two uh, ways of partitioning. One is called checkerboard. So if you give me an image, in a checkerboard fashion, I put uh, these uh, pixels in group one. 
copy paste to Z space, and then I apply an affine transformation on the other parts. But then I can change this checker port, right? So it doesn't have to be the same the same uh, set of pixels. And they use also channel partitioning. Let's say I have, so they, they do like a channel squeeze, so they increase the number of channels. And then let's say I have two channel, four channels. Maybe I can partition these two in my first group and partition these two uh, parts of my input as my second group. So I basically just alternate between different partitions. I think they use like three checkerboard and three channel partitioning. And that gives a more expressive uh, mapping from, um, from X to Z or Z to X. And they have also like some uh, additional um, uh, elements uh, to uh, enrich the mapping. So that's their multi-scale architecture that they propose. But that's basically the, the gist of their idea that they have. Okay. Um, then you may ask, uh, okay, so is this the, the, the only way that we can compose these um, uh, layers? No, you can come up with any, um, any uh, functions, invertible, that the determinant is easy, and then you can you know, compose them in an arbitrary fashion and see which one uh, works the best. And in fact, uh, there is a follow-up paper, uh, many follow-up papers. So one of them is called GLOW that we posted on the course webpage by Kingma ETL. That they do some, you know, some minor changes. They change the batch norm and stuff to make it like more data dependent in the initialization. But one thing that they use, um, uh, one kind of non-trivial thing that they use is to use an invertible one by one convolution or a fancy name to uh, refer to a matrix multiplication. Right, so in a convolution, if this is your image, convolution filters is usually applied, like, let's say, on a K by K subset of the uh, uh, pixels. But one by one is basically uh, being applied to a one pixel, to different channels that you have. And then you just multiply it with, with a matrix. Right, so it's a one by one convolution. So you multiply it by a matrix. Let's say that matrix is W. Let's call this uh, the channel vector V1. Then you get W times V1 would be uh, V2. And then you replace your, uh, your uh, channel uh, vector with V2. So that's one by one convolution. And if this guy is invertible, then you are good, right? So you can uh, basically. Um, have a, an invertible transformation uh, from one space to another space. And that's basically one uh, change that they, they have in GLOW compared to real MVP. Uh, the determinant of this uh, matrix depends on the dimension of V1 and V2. Again, for large matrices, if you have like a lot of number of uh, channels, input and output, then that can be expensive. Uh, so one idea that they have is they restrict themselves to a particular class of uh, affine transformations. In particular, they use Ws, these uh, matrices, in this form, which is a multiplicative factor of P times L times U plus diagonal of a, mat a diagonal matrix here P is a permutation matrix. L is a lower triangular uh, matrix. U is upper triangular matrix. 
Okay, so why why do they use this form? And S the diagonal of S is like a diagonal matrix because there is a another algebraic fact that determinant of a function uh, matrix like this can be easily computed. It is basically just the sum of the log of the uh, diagonal elements here is. But you can use any other uh, matrix that you know you can compute the um, Jacobian quite efficiently. There's nothing fundamental about this. And they replace the permutation because this is a little, little bit of a larger class than the permutation of the channels. Right? So in the real MVP for their, uh, between their coupling, so they do permutation uh, among channels to make sure that each channel is represented in different partitioning uh, uh, one or two. So this is a little bit of a, an extension of uh, that channel permutation. Okay, that's it. That's about real NVP and GLOW. Uh, let me pause and take uh, questions. Okay, so how are we defining expressiveness? So I'm defining in a very, very hand wavy fashion, but empirically we want to uh, have a generative model that for instance is able to generate realistic images. Right? So if uh, you use a very simple function, it won't be able to do it because the generator function is not able to generate images. How do we train this? Don't we need the gradient of the loss? Yes. Gradient of the loss is easy, right? Because I have, for instance, let's look at the Jacobian term here. So the gradient, the log of the determinant of the Jacobian is just the sum of the log of these S's. Easy uh, to compute, easy to compute the gradients. Okay. Um, Okay, so how much time I have? So I have about 15 minutes. Okay, so let me first talk about some, um, uh, some other aspects of flow-based models. Uh, Glow uh, has a really nice demo on OpenAI. So if you have uh, time, uh, today I'll show the demo at the end. Uh, but let's uh, talk about some other aspects in terms of the stability, uh, robustness, and meaningfulness of these probability numbers that we get from the flow-based models. Okay, so I see one more question. So why are these called flow-based models? Because, um, again, uh, the composition of invertible functions are called normalizing flows. And that's why they are called flow-based generative models. Okay, so one step that uh, in training uh, these models that is uh, often used is called dequantization. Okay, so the data is discrete, right? So um, you may have different resolutions, but in, in a computer, the data is, um, going to come in a discrete um, form. Uh, and what you are doing here is, let's say you have a discrete distribution and you want to fit a density. So here we are fitting a density function to a discrete distribution. Uh, so what can happen is that we may have uh, some really uh, large uh, peaks uh, in our function P uh, theta of x. So fitting a density function can have to discrete data can have a really crazy peaks. And why is that the case? Because your function phi theta only uh, observes the values in a discrete um, uh, discrete points of this space. Right? So it doesn't observe uh, values, for example, nearby those points, like points like here. Uh, so in order to um, 
uh, reduce some uh, crazy peaks that we may observe or very high curvature regions, you have two options, right? One option is to add regularizations. Regularizations to P theta, just to uh, smooth it out. Uh, another option is to, uh, through a process called dequantization. And this is what uh, people they use in uh, practice because it is uh, much, much easier than adding a regularization term. Okay, so what is dequantization? Dequantization says, okay, uh, just show some uh, neighboring uh, samples to your uh, density estimator. So I'm gonna add a uniform noise to my samples, not to uh, just fit on an exact point. So I'll just like add a uniform noise to make sure that my densities well behave in the neighborhood of that point. Right, so that's the idea of dequantization. Effectively speaking, it says at uniform noise to the data, and it makes the density function significantly stable. Right? So if you have some points here, then what you're doing is that you're adding a uniform noise. Um, okay, so this should be. to make sure that your density uh, fits this more well-behaved uh, function and then it will be um, uh, more well-behaved. Here is the place that some approximation and some hand wavy stuff comes into the picture uh, because at the end of the day, if you wanna replace each point with the average density that you get, you need to also compute an integral uh, potentially in a high dimension, uh, that can also be com complicated to compute uh, because let's say if you have, if you're replacing uh, xi, you add a uniform noise, this is the uniform noise. And then let's replace the density here with the average density in the neighborhood average over this uniform distribution that you have. So what you get is average of the density of P xi plus delta, then if you apply, we, we compute the log of this, right? So if you apply the log here, using Jensen's, you can bring the log here, but you'll get a lower bound, similar to the variational lower bound that we had in the VAE case. So you would get log of P xi plus delta, but again, this, this delta is uniform uh, between some, uh, uh, some uh, hype in a hypercube, right? So it's a high dimensional space, hard to compute. So in practice, people, they approximate it by just drawing one uniform sample from delta and just training the model by just perturbed version of the samples. So that's an approximation that is being done in practice. Question well, on that. Yes, please. So how, how can that possibly work if you're only using one sample to approximate that expectation? Uh, you know, in, in a way, it, 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 this part is very bad, right? So you, uh, you, you have a lot of, you know, potentially a uh, big gap between that expectation and this approximation. But in my, my intuition is that in fact, you know, adding just a noisy uh, sample in training is not doing these variational lower bounds. So what it does is it just adds a regularization to smooth it out the fitting of the density function because instead of looking at the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the distribution, the discrete distribution at a particular point, in each batch, you get like a slightly perturbed version of it, and then your function has to uh, be good over all of those perturbations, so it adds a little bit of a smoothness to your function. And that's why it uh, uh, works well in uh, practice. And all of the trainings of these uh, models are, you know, as far as I know, are done uh, using this dequantization technique. Thank you, that's helpful. Good. Uh, so let me uh, move on. I'll uh, 
get back to your questions at the end. So another aspect uh, of uh, one really good and important aspect of the flow-based models is that we have the exact likelihood estimations. Ignoring the quantization, uh, the quantization errors that we are introducing, but here I have a model p theta of x that gives me the exact uh, likelihood of observing a sample x from a particular model. Uh, the question is then, you know, this is amazing, right? Because, for instance, we can use um, in uh, anomaly detection or out of distribution uh, detection. Problems. So you uh, train, let's say you are given a data set, right? So you, your training set, let's say it is C4, 10, cats and dogs and some other classes, horses, whatever. So you train your flow based model and then it computes, uh, it gives you this really nice function this density function. And you can even plot, uh, look at the histogram of the P theta of X over your uh, CIFAR samples. Right? So you'll get uh, test samples of your CIFAR. And you'll get uh, potentially a function like this. So this is the CIFAR test samples. So this P theta of X is trained on the training part of the CIFAR thing. Okay, now if you give me a sample from a very, very different distribution, if you give me a sample from, let's say, MNIST, how about that? MNIST, they're like black and white, very different than the CIFAR samples. And you use the P theta trained on a CIFAR. So what do you expect? So do you expect, okay, so let me just redraw it. So this is the CIFAR probabilities. Okay, so which one do you expect? Do you expect your probabilities will be higher if you evaluate on MNES? Or do you expect your uh, probabilities should be lower if you evaluate on MNIST, which, which are samples that look very differently than, uh, than CIFAR samples. What do you expect? I see a lot of uh, answers, lower likelihoods, right? Uh, because it's a very different, different data set than the one I have trained my model. So here, this is what I expect. But can you guess what I observe in practice? This is what I observe in practice. quite surprising, right? Kind of, you know, we were like really excited saying that, okay, good. You know, we have this really exact uh, uh, density estimators, but then, um, then uh, we observe a phenomenon like this. Uh, in fact, as uh, you know, one of your friends uh, mentioned, this is not specific to flow-based models, not specific, this, phenomena to flow based models. Even if you use uh, VAEs to, to you know, have approximate likelihoods, if you use like pixel uh, CNNs, which another uh, method that gives you like some likelihood estimations, same, same behavior can be observed. 
Right, so therefore, you know, we got to be a little bit careful, you know, uh, if these uh, likelihood uh, uh, values are in fact useful in practice or not. So let me uh, just briefly explain in a very hand wavy fashion why this actually makes sense. Right? So let's suppose that my P theta is a Gaussian distribution, let's say normal distribution, just for simplicity, you can extend. Uh, and D is very large. So if you look at the samples that you generate from your data set, with high probability, all of your samples, they're going to have length of square root of D. It's a very simple concentration uh, behavior that if you have a Gaussian sample, if you look at uh, the norm of this, this is like a chi-square distribution, and this is roughly speaking order d. If you look at just the length, it is a square root of d. So with high probability, all of the samples that you generate from your distribution, they are going to live very close to the surface of a sphere uh, with the radius square root of d. And let's, if we, let's say we fit, you know, a Gaussian um, density to this using maximum likelihood, then we estimate that uh, Gaussian density. Now in the test time, in the test time, suppose I'm giving a O0 vector, right? So this is, let's say this is my test. It looks very, very different than your typical uh, samples observed from P theta, right? Because your typical samples with high probability, they have a, a norm of the square root of D. But this guy, the test is like, you know, all black image, say all zero. Question, now if you evaluate P theta of X uh, test, and compare it with like, let's say a typical uh, sample that you observed, which one is higher? The test one. Right? So because the Gaussian density uh, is something like this, right? So you're going to have a Gaussian density. So this is the highest uh, density that you can get. So in a way, this guy is a very simple uh, point. It is not typical, but it has the uh, highest uh, uh, probability. So there is a, basically a difference between a typical sample that you can observe from a data set with high probability uh, samples that you can observe from this data set. And in fact, there's a you know, huge literature uh, just based on this uh, in information uh, theory uh, to basically ignore atypical uh, sequences. So I'm not saying this is the only way explaining the phenomena that I mentioned, but this is one um, hand wavy explanation because MNIST, fashion MNIST, these are like simpler data set. They have a smaller variance uh, compared to, let's say, a uh, data set like, uh, uh, like uh, CIFAR. So there are a bunch of uh, papers uh, try to explain this phenomenon. Um, uh, uh, one of them is by, by these guys, I think in 2019, and the other one that we posted in the course page. They look at, for instance, you know, uh, what happens in flow-based models. But one thing to keep in mind is that this, this phenomenon is not particular to uh, flow-based uh, models. It can also be observed in BAE. So we shouldn't just focusing on you know, one model to explain what is going on here. Uh, just to conclude uh, the discussions on the flow-based models, so we talked about the issues in terms of their likelihood computation, uh, but in fact, you can uh, adversarially attack uh, these likelihoods, even if they uh, make sense for a particular data set, you can perturb uh, some samples from that data set in order to 
make the likelihoods look uh, very different than what you should expect. Even if you have a uniform noise, you can you know, add some adversarial uh, noise to it such that the likelihoods can uh, look like uh, normal likelihoods. Uh, so that problem uh, is being discussed in a paper uh, titled flow-based, uh, basically the idea is that flow-based models uh, can be, in fact, are very fragile also to uh, adversarial attacks. And that's uh, a paper by, uh, uh, by my group, uh, Phil, uh, Yogesh, and myself in AI stats. So there we, in fact, uh, look into, um, I think ASS 2020, right? Uh, there we, in fact, not only look into uh, the sensitivity uh, of GLOW and other flow-based models, but also we analyze it for uh, simple linear uh, flow-based models, you know, when you just look at multi-variate uh, Gaussian distributions. Okay, uh, that's all I have for flow-based models. Again, I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late. I'll pause here and take your questions.